Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan, and my guest in episode 41 is Nick Fike. Since its inception in 2005, The Monthly has been one of the few Australian publications to strongly invest in long-form journalism. Each month, the magazine publishes a handful of essays from some of Australia's best writers and critics, which regularly run in excess of 5,000 words apiece. Because of this dedication to funding and promoting serious journalism that concerns the nature's culture and politics, The Monthly has built a large and devoted base of subscribers and readers. Nick Fike has been in the editor's chair since April 2014, after joining the magazine's publisher, Schwartz Media, several years earlier to establish online projects which included daily email newsletters and building a home for long-form video. I met with Nick at the Schwartz Media office in Melbourne in late July, shortly after he and his team had sent the August issue off to be printed. Our conversation touches on the origins of a cover story that Nick wrote about the effects that tech giants Facebook and Google are having on the media landscape, how the choice of cover, photograph or illustration can affect the monthly's newsstand sales, his routine for getting away from screens in order to read first drafts without distractions, what he's looking for when commissioning work from first-time contributors to the magazine, and how he feels about being the first person to cast his eyes across essays by great writers such as Helen Garner. Introducing Nick Fike, editor of The Monthly. Nick Fike, thank you for joining me. Pleasure. I want to start by asking you about your cover story in the current issue of The mm. Monthly. We're recording this in late July, so coming towards the end of the month. But how did this story idea come to you? Uh, look, it was a case of... Um, well, there was a Senate inquiry that came up into the future of uh, journalism... Uh, It seemed to me there was a shift in the political winds uh, with politicians like um, Nick Xenophon and Sam Dastiari taking, and Scott Ludlam taking a a kind of keen interest in in the issue of uh, like the effects that Facebook and Google are having on on the rest of the media. And um, I thought it was important that we um, at length basically consider these kinds of issues and put a lot of the pieces together for, for readers. So, um, look, at the, basically it was the decision was made also on the back of uh, the Fairfax. Um, they dropped 125 staff to save $30 million. I think it was like the 12th, 10th redundancy round in 12 years apparently. Mm. Uh, and it seemed to me that these were kind of inexorable trends, but that there's still a lot of people that don't realise in the kind of wider world that a lot of the ad revenue uh, that's dropping off print media is going to Facebook and Google. So in terms of the, the general ideas of of why we wanted to run a piece, that that's the kind of background. And in terms of, like, in terms of me writing it, um, I... I I've been following these kind of issues for a long time, Facebook especially, um, and I kind of knew what uh, I wanted you know, us to say, mm. so it, it, it seemed actually just easier for me to do it myself. You don't write for the magazine all that often. Mm. Yeah, is that an, an easy decision to make or something that you look forward to, writing those occasional... Uh, longer pieces for the Mac? It's kind of on, on a as-needs basis. Yeah. Um, you know, look, occasionally things kind of drop out at the last minute and uh, it, it kind of gives me... Uh, it takes a little bit of pressure off my off my shoulders as an editor to know that if, you know, if push comes to shove, I, you know, I'm, I'm there at the last minute if, if necessary. <laughs> Something like this. Well, this is actually the longest piece that I've done uh, by... By quite some some way, so look, I don't um, I don't have a burning urge like a lot of writers do to write, but um, but I do enjoy it, and when I think it's um, 
you know, when I think it's, I've, I've got something to say as well. Like I, I, I'm kind of allergic to just writing for writing's sake. Like I could never be a weekly columnist or something like that. It was a great piece. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. How'd you go about uh, editing the piece? Did you edit yourself or did you farm it out to someone else? No, no, I, f- I farmed it out to many people actually. I think <laughs> by the time uh, it went to press, it had been read over by uh, at least five people. Uh, f- yeah, like five five professional editors had looked it over. So my brother, who uh, works here, he's the editor of the quarterly essay, was probably the main... Um, the the fiercest editor, uh, I trust him. He's you know he's a he's a pretty fine editor. So um, and then you know we have our usual production processes. I I told uh, our deputy editor Natalie Book and and Patrick, um, who's a production editor, not to uh, not to uh, not to spare me. Don't spare the rod. <laughs> and how did you take that? Are you, are you okay with uh, notes and suggestions or? Did you go away and stew for a bit on particularly fierce edits from your brother? Well, look, I because I have you know I've uh, I'm, you know, I've I have a lot of faith in him, so uh, I think I probably let him get away with some things that maybe I wouldn't let others. Or it's some there were a few things that were kind of consensus issues. Um, I wrote slightly too long in the first pass, so I knew that something had to come out of it. But you know, it's always easier for someone else to see mm. what should come out. You 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 don't know what's um, what's common. It's harder for you to tell after you've been reading about these things for months what's already kind of common knowledge, mm. so that you, you can therefore take it out without restating things in detail or um, things like that. But yeah, no, I I. I um, it would be pretty weird for me as an editor to not uh, to not respect the art of editing. Yeah, yeah. Will we expect more longer pieces from you, or is it kind of hard to fit around your regular workload? Well, no, it's, it's it is hard actually. I, I sort of, even though it was a pretty smooth write, this one, I uh, as in it kind of went to rough plan. I planned it for a good few weeks and then had really set aside a kind of certain amount of time to write it, uh, which I knew was really coming out of my, my sort of editing work. So even though it went well, um, by the end of it I thought, well, uh, you know, I think that it's all panned out well and then I realised I was suddenly behind in commissioning other things. So there's always, you know, there's a push and pull. What I put into there comes out of here. Mm-hmm. Um, so look, no, no, no obvious plans, and I don't have any. As I say, I don't have any kind of great burning desire. But um, if a if a topic comes up that I think, uh, you know, that I could do well, um, yeah. But no, no special plans. Mm-hmm. It is the cover story in this month's edition, and the cover features a striking image of Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook. How important is the cover image to each magazine? Well, so comparatively speaking, compared to other magazines, uh, arguably it's less important because we have such a strong subscription base. So something like three quarters of our readers are subscribers. Uh, But, you know, it can make the difference. It can make a difference of a couple of thousand copies if you get the the cover right versus wrong. Mm. Um, I mean, you can never look. It's it's a weird kind of art. Um, it's not a science. We've we've for a long time we've tried to figure out what 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 works. What's if if there's such a thing as a bulletproof idea, and what are the kinds of names and concepts that appeal to our readers? And we've kind of got a vague grasp of it. Is in our readers are more, more interested in politics. Uh, you know, they are interested in politics. They are more likely to pick up uh, a magazine if they feel strongly about the person on the cover. But that can be a hate as much as a as a like. Mm. Uh, but there has to be a general kind of interest. Um, so, but in terms of like, um, in terms of when you get beyond the really obvious things like putting the opposition leader or the prime minister or the treasurer or Pauline Hanson or someone like that on the cover beyond that it's a, it's a, it's kind of a toss up so we we never actually know hmm. that much 
how how something's going to go in the stores. Can you think of some examples of getting the cover right or wrong during your three plus years as editor? Um, well, right, uh, we had a, a couple of good covers with uh, like David Ma wrote an essay on Tony Abbott and it was illustrated with this kind of fantastically hideous picture of Tony Abbott um, and it was a combination of the, the illustrator, the writer and uh, it was the whole package basically and the subject that really appealed so that did well. Same illustrator did a great cover of uh, Pauline Hanson again with Richard Cook writing the essay that did really well. Mm. What's uh, the illustrator's name? Uh, Neil Moore. He does great work. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Like an incredible, incredible artist. And he did the tenth anniversary That's cover correct. as well, which had a selection of yeah, key yeah, figures yeah. from politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, he's 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 kind of amazing. He he, uh, but you know you can't use the same device each time, and you run out of politicians to use. As in. I, I'm kind of struck sometimes by how little recognition some politicians get. So, you know, even someone like Peter Dutton, I think by now people would kind of recognise him, but it'd be a line ball as to whether he could carry a cover because, you know, a lot of people would sort of loathe him uh, and there'd be a, a whole bunch of people that still don't actually know who he is. So there's a kind of limit to how much we can do and I'm, I'm not... I'm not that strong a believer in just taking a punt on putting an unknown face on there just in order to inform people, educate people. I, I, it kind of doesn't, um, it doesn't really help. So, you know, I know even covers that I have really felt strongly about, you know, that we did the right things. So, you know, I know that you can sometimes lose you know, a thousand, two thousand readers if they don't recognise the person on the front cover, like someone like Gulleroy Unipingu. So this is an issue that was a kind of, it was like 75% Indigenous writers. Uh, this was last year, I think. Late last year. Late last year. Uh, so it didn't sell that well in, in the stand, on the stands. Um, had a picture of Gulleroy on the front and he's not, you know, not greatly recognised, obviously. Um, and even though that essay was probably, you know, it's probably that issue and that essay in particular were among, for me, they were like my proudest publishing achievements in terms of magazine articles and, and whole magazines. Uh, that particular issue, you know, didn't sell particularly well even though I th you know I thought it was so important so you know it's a toss-up as well as in how much do we want to um, invest um, it's like having credit how much do you do you want to spend on something you, you really got to feel strongly about it if you if you know that it's not necessarily going to be a huge seller yeah there's some some interesting decisions I'm thinking of the recent cover of Donald Trump yeah, it was a photo of him from the from the back, Behind, yeah, with his hands in the air. I think, yeah, uh, Don Watson's yeah. essay about him, yeah, that was. Uh, uh, tell me about that decision because, as a reader, it was really striking to look at. But yeah. the reason why you're not putting his face on the cover versus a shot from the behind, what was the thinking behind that? Uh, well, um, Every he was on every second cover, basically, of every magazine around the world. This was in Feb, Feb or March this year, and uh, either Mori or our designer Peter Long had a theory that you could tell Donald Trump from any angle, <laughs> and because he has such a distinctive head and hair shape, and neck and everything like that, uh, we were sort of looking around for ways of present of making it doing a Donald Trump cover that was actually different mm. from the others and getting a picture of him from behind I thought yeah look I thought there was something about the drama of that shot as well because it was taken behind him him being on stage kind of yeah holding up his fists you could just just make out uh, shadows of people so you realized he's on a stage looking out to this kind of mass this is in darkness mm. but um, 
it matched the piece as well because the piece was about Donald Trump as a kind of showman, con man, shyster, mm. but a sort of showbiz figure basically. Mm. So a kind of it's a combination of things like that. But um, there are some amazing, you know, there are some amazing photos of Donald Trump that don't show his face <laughs> around. Yeah. How far ahead are you in production with? Um, future issues right now so well, where are you in the production cycle right now so uh, we just finished a the um, August issue so that'll go out to subscribers in at the end of this week so they're printing it now and it'll be on stands at the end of on, on Monday uh, and we're straight into the next one so September uh, look if you'd asked me four days ago, I would have said I'm not that far ahead. Um, I always like to have essays kind of commissioned, f- definitely for the next month, but for the next couple of months, because if it's a piece that's 7,000 words, you, you really want someone to have been working on it for a couple of months. And, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of really good freelancers are busy you know people you can't just expect people to drop things and work on something for a month when you want them to work on it Mm. Uh, so really we're working months out now so even though a few days ago I was a bit concerned about you know the September October issues a handful of things have fallen into place so now I feel kind of steady in the sense that I have a kind of backbone of, of essays going out to more or less to yeah November even yeah to November hmm. and not everything's commissioned and it, it's a you know the longer pieces you sort of commission earlier the shorter pieces take less time so they can be done closer to the time it sort of depends on what who and what and whether we know you know with review things book reviews whether we can get copies of the books in advance and hmm. these sorts of things the essays are pretty prized um, in terms of their profile and length. Mm. There's not many places, mm. probably the only place in Australia that runs 7,000 mm. word mm. pieces is the monthly. Mm. What do you want an essay to achieve in general terms? Or maybe cite some examples. Yeah, yeah. Mind. Well, I mean, look, the start from kind of basic principles. So we have 11 issues a year and we ba- we on average have three kind of major essays in each of those. So there's 33 essays to write about everything that we think is important in Australia. It has to be topical. Uh, so the considerations for me are, is as an Australian magazine and really the only Australian magazine that's able to kind of pay journalists by the word to do long-form journalism we might, I mean we, we, we almost are that the only one to in terms of sort of uh, like like political and social affairs these kinds of things so to me it's important that an essay actually has uh, that it adds something new and unique to an important issue or that it says something uh, that you know that should be said about our culture. Uh, there's a whole bunch of issues where I would say you need a lot of words to explain in you know to really get down to brass tacks and actually explore what the fundamental problem is. you need those words. So something like an essay on the NBN where you're tracing it back to those moments where, uh, Kevin Rudd, you know, was reputed to have drawn the idea on a cocktail napkin and handed it to his advisors, and then, I mean, which wasn't the case anyway. But for an essay that starts with a, a kind of rumor like that and then traces it all the way through to this gigantic, the biggest infrastructure project in Australia's history, no one understands the tech properly, no one understands the business case properly. So you kind of need that length, but you also, um, I think it's important that the fact that we have, that we are able to do it means that to some extent, you know, that we have a sort of responsibility to do pieces like that. So there's a few other, 
you know essays in that kind of category like Richard Dennis has written wrote a great piece on the gas industry Jess Hill wrote a, this amazing piece on the, on power prices the corruption of you know, the sort of poles and wires spending by the big companies that just couldn't have been said in less than five five and a half thousand words it had a big impact I think on the debate generally um, so there's yeah and then of course you need to find an angle you need to make it interesting you know the idea that you could get you know tens of thousands of people reading and five thousand words about power prices mm-hmm. you, you really need to think why why are they going to what are they reading what's where's the drama what's the story so um yeah so they're they're the kind of considerations basically two other examples that i really enjoyed this year were richard cook's essay on the boomer supremacy yeah it's called yeah and richard dennis on grandfathering the australian dream yeah both of those were so unique in their tone and length that mm. I, I couldn't have read it anywhere else and I, mm. I was thankful that the monthly published both mm. of those because they were brilliant reads mm, great yeah well, again just that yeah unique writers uh, take, taking with, who both had a very strong sort of idea of what they wanted to say about this debate yeah you know, in an essay like this you can draw in economics and cultural policy and and yeah, it can be of a kind of cultural moment. So Richard's, Richard Cook's piece, you know, started off by talking about the Sydney lockouts and this became a piece about the culture of old people locking out young people. Like it was a, it was, it was a, right, it was a great sort of metaphor. So um, like in both of those cases, it, look at some... If you see a good idea, you know, sometimes they just jump out at you and you realise that you need to give more words to something like this. So, you know, I, there's a lot of things that are just too hard you, that can't really be said properly in 800 words to 1,000 words, sort of an opinion piece like that. So um, by the same token, uh, new ideas, uh, you know, there probably aren't as many new ideas in the media as we like to think. But when they do come around, yeah, it's, uh, it's worth um, prioritising. That Richard, when Richard Cook put that piece out, it just went, it went just everywhere immediately. Yeah. It obviously hit hit a nerve, which I kind of, we sort of hoped it would. Um, but yeah, yeah. How do you decide how long an essay should be, and how often does your original idea of the length change throughout the um, editing yeah. production process? Uh, look for the shorter pieces they often stay around so things between sort of 800 and 1500 often end up around the sort of commission length essays uh, look if anything they end, so they sometimes get a little bit longer when something gets uncovered in the process or you realize that it's slightly bigger than you thought uh, but look it's it's a kind of intuitive thing, really. Um, you have to wonder about whether something's going to be topical when the piece comes out, whether you're adding anything new, as in how much value is there for us publishing this? Do we do you go really you know go to the hilt with it, or do you just summarise something in a, in a way? Uh, you know, like we've got a piece in the coming issue. Uh, Alex McKinnon has written about the robo debt program. Uh, there was a Senate report out recently, a Senate committee report, and I thought this is an issue that has kind of been covered around the place. But anyone who hadn't actually paid attention to the debate from the start might not have caught. So I think there's, you know, there's a. It's sometimes it's a case of just wanting to put something on the record, like to be a kind of publication that, um, you know, that just records certain things. And that was a kind of that report gave us an opportunity to not do a huge, a huge long piece, but just a kind of you know a medium length piece on on an important issue. So yeah, look, it's it it kind of depends on the subject, it depends on the writer, depends on the angle. Um, yeah. 
but we, it's almost always the fact that the case that we that I know roughly in advance what um, or we certainly aim to write to a particular length in advance. Do you find as an editor you need to be in a certain headspace or time of day to open a writer's first draft that they've sent to you? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, well, put it this way, I, I actually. I, I get up from my desk and sit in a different chair hmm. so, to get away from my computer and phone uh, and I print it out on paper, the first draft, hmm. and I sit and read it with a pen in hand um, and I try to do it when I'm not too tired uh, so, you know, that you're not... And you Look, it, it kind of depends, but... Um, yeah, look, it's a it's an important first read, and I I just find it much easier to read it on paper. How long have you followed that uh, structure or that process of getting uh, away from the computer, editing? Uh, um, well, that's just for the first read. Look, yes. I've basically since the start, um, it's probably just a growing up with you know with analog technology, printed technology, rather than. Phones, you know. I think I'm still like probably most people, still struggling to um, to get away from screens and to you know it, it, these things really affect your um, your attention span and even if it's kind of near you. So just for me, the act of just getting up and sitting somewhere different is like sending a sign to to your brain that this is where you have to. You know, you, this is where you're not distracted. This is where you read things in full, you know, in full paragraphs, full pages, and uh, and and um, I heard about someone who had a uh, who bought a lectern and she put it on. She's living in Queensland, I think, with a lectern that she put on on the um, facing out the back window. Mm. And she said that, that, and this is her like serious reading spot. Wow! So she go, this is one for the lectern. So she and she'd stand at it and like read, read sort of serious material. It's like a way of triggering herself to um, yeah. Huh. <laughs> Do you read the first draft in full in one session without distraction? Yeah. Ideally. Ideally. Do yeah. you have, so it's a spot in in the office here. People know not to disturb you when you're sitting in that spot, I suppose. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I put headphones on too, and uh, and sometimes I sometimes I even turn music on, but uh, only particular sorts of music uh, actually help. It's quite strange. I know Anne Crawford was saying that she can't have lyrics. It can't be music with lyrics. It, she finds that distracting. I think I'm I'm actually a bit the same of that with really obvious um, rhythms, drums. It just gets me. Uh, it doesn't help at all. So um, it, it, you have to find you know find the right kind of piece of music if I'm going to do that or noise cancelling headphones, these sorts of things. So what kind of music do you like listening to when editing occasionally? Um, oh, it, it's weird because I, I, things that I don't actually even listen to in normal, in mostly in normal life, like strangely kind of. Um, bark works well for my brain um, th- like Arvo Part um, Eric Sarti so kind of classical music often um, yeah I, that's probably the and again I, I stress it's not because I'm a, a kind of um, a huge classical music buff it's just that it, there's something um, about uh, those textures that relax the brain or allow them to hmm. to do other things so you, they don't, yeah, it doesn't kind of hook in the brain what are you looking for when you're reading a first draft in that situation are you looking to be moved or to feel something by the end of it and how do you tell when things aren't working um, good question I I try to read it like like it with a view to how a reader's going to take it. So I've sort of trained myself to catch to catch myself being bored. Mm. So when you kind of basically points of confusion or boredom are, are the, the kind of the the stop sign basically where you sort of 
get through a paragraph and have completely forgotten it by the time you're at the end or mm. that, that you just there's just too much detail here so sometimes it's actually about thinning thinning things out uh, it's really about pacing um, it's about structure uh, so they're, they're the kinds of things that I'm looking for not so much kind of niggly details like I, I'm sort of not interested in whether you know it's the right kind of in dash or whether you know it should be a, a colon or a semicolon or these sorts of things so the first yeah the first draft is very much about um, how does it open uh, does it have momentum does it kind of tick over and is there anything here that people just simply won't understand so you know it, you kind of it's a part of your brain that has a, a general reader in it like I kind of have you know there's a I sometimes think I wonder if my mum would understand this Mm. Um, you know as a kind of educated intelligent general reader and then you sort of think well how would um, you know someone the other kind of ideal reader being someone maybe quite different like uh, someone in their sort of late 20s who doesn't um, you know, there's a, a couple of people kind of that I have in my mind that I think I wonder if they, what they would get out of this would they have stopped reading at this point? Do you mark on the page when you're getting bored or confused? Uh, yeah, in a kind of way. Yeah, um, sometimes I'll just it'll just be like a big sort of line and a big question mark. Sometimes it'll yeah, but it's sort of, you try not to get bogged down on that first pass. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I'll definitely mark as in like it'll just be notes to myself. That I find as a writer, that uh, moment when you press send on an email to an editor with yeah. the first draft attached and waiting to hear back from them, that's the most anxiety inducing yeah, moment right. of being a writer. Yeah. How do you um, massage or frame mm. your feedback to a writer on a first draft? I, I'm kind of cognizant of that actually um so I, I got a really good piece of advice very early on from robert mann who said who, who used to be an editor at quadrant back when it was not the kind of rabid right wing sort of terrible thing that it is now when it was like a serious kind of magazine small little liberal and and sort of conservative magazine um he said uh get back to writers quickly and let them know what you think, especially, you know, if you like it as much as if if you don't like it. Mm. Uh, so I've always been, I've always tried to get back to people as quickly as possible. Uh, look, for efficiency's sake as well, you know, we you're often working, um, you're going back and forth with some writers. If it needs help, you might be going back with back even me before I send it on to a copy editor I might go back and forth three times um, just to, with notes back and forth you know to suggestions and that sort of thing um, look everyone every writer bar a very very small handful and it's not always you know the ones that you'd expect but almost every writer gets nervous and you know I, I'm, I'm still I'm still surprised by the kind of people who still go, oh, phew, you know, I'm glad you like it. It's like, a, you know, you think, God, of course I'm going to like it. But how, how could you not think this is brilliant? Or like, but people still, I know that people don't really know. So, look, it's a, it's, it's a really crucial part of the job for, for me. Like to, we think of ourselves as a magazine that looks after its writers and, and, it, and, and the writing so uh, I think you know managing people's expectations and looking after them as much as their writing is I think the way that you keep a lot of writers uh, so I yeah how do you couch feedback on things that you don't like or moments of boredom or confusion mm. how do you um, kind of frame that to, yeah. to a writer in a way that's not going to make them throw their hands up and despair. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's it's all about specificity. You, you have to explain. Um, I think if you're going to make a, a, a broad statement along the lines of, you know, this is slow, this bit's 
is slow or it might be too heavy for you know a particular kind of general reader it's it's all about specificity and 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 creative constructive suggestions as to how to actually fix it like I, i I generally try not to get back to people with just a general sense of this part's boring it's much more likely that I'd sort of get back and go would you consider taking out you know the second half of this paragraph or moving this section to later when people will understand it better dropping so I mean you know dropping the acronyms it's this kind of fairly yeah very specific kind of um suggestions and some it, it it really depends on the piece so sometimes you'll just get I'll just get back to a writer and say I, I you know I, I only have very minor suggestions I'm going to pass it straight on mm. for copy editing sometimes it's a whole structural kind of um, you know a whole bunch of suggestions sometimes I'll kind of rewrite large sections kind of as as suggestions not not sorry not sections but like have suggested rewrites of certain sentences that you know and say what about if we thought about writing it this kind of way but that again only only that that's only with a writer that I've got a long term kind of relationship with mm. um but it's just kind of different for every writer you know you you sh- it you have to manage different people different ways um some are more fragile than others perhaps some are more fragile than others and some some, you know, I wish they were more fragile. Like sometimes, um, it really you kind of just have to get a sense of where they think the essay is at. And and often when I, I think it's often a case of saying to someone, where do you think it's at? Hmm. As in, was this a first draft that is this one that you you know you, you're willing to do a lot of work on, or do you think we're almost there? Or so. There's sometimes you have to realise early on that there are kind of limits to how much also you you know you want to try to push someone. Mm. Uh, again, it's, it's sort of managing relationships as well as individual pieces. Yeah, I want to ask about the editing process of a cover story from maybe two months ago, Helen Garner's piece called "Why She Broke," mm-hmm. which had one of the most striking cover images that I've seen in the magazine yeah you know headline and image itself um, talk a little about that and how long that one was in train yeah uh, so um, well I've been talking to Helen for a long time on that piece at least six ma- na- months more like nine I think mm. the court case had been going for a little while I knew that she'd been to a couple of sessions early on I, this it's kind of a complicated story, and I, I wonder how much I can kind of go into. But basically, it was one that I was I would I always wanted her to write, but the kind of complications in the sense that I know that when she wrote uh, this house of grief, it took her a long time to actually, you know, psychologically recover from that like that book should not have gone on for that long she would say so herself Mm. it's partly because it was you know because of the retrial I don't think anyone goes to a into a book project thinking that they're going to spend the next eight years in and out of courts over a guy who's killing his three who's killed his three kids so I was kind of cognizant of of um having to be delicate about proposing this as an idea but you know I knew that she got interested in this case and the saving grace was basically that she that this was a kind of way of writing about similar issues but really in a completely different way as in the fact that it was a mother rather than a father that it wasn't driven by hate mm. I think it made it much easier to to write about so uh, we sort of you know, we talked a while about it, and then she uh, she got into it. She just got hooked by the particular elements in the story, but mm. in particular when she understood that how difficult Guode's life had been, there was a kind of um, sympathy there, which um, I think it was much easier to kind of address the subject when she found those connections. Mm. 
Uh, and then, look, I just, we, we sort of talked and she wrote and, and it, a few bits went back and forth, uh, a few sections and I was, and then um, Helen's such a great writer, right? She, she writes almost perfect prose. It comes in extremely clean. Mm. Uh, it's it's often just a case of looking at a few words here and there, saying, "Is that exactly the emphasis that you mean? This is how I'm reading it." And she might go, "Oh no, I meant it more like this, like that." Mm. And then, so it's you sort of it's a a kind of dialogue in a lot of ways. Mm. Uh, and then there was a section, there was a sec- a section that um, uh, was a, a originally much longer in in the first draft that I thought was um, unnecessarily so it was not um, so I sort of I, I said look I you know my two cents is that we don't need all of this detail uh, and she kind of agreed and then you know it was um, yeah it was, look it was a really it was it was the kind of perfect experience actually writer and editor she really appreciated having someone who um, would be able to concentrate on it for so over such a long period of time and of course you know I get to work with Helen Garner so um, yeah no she, she and then that look the title was hers um, the image we found it all, it all worked well yeah when you print out first draft of a I don't know, multiple thousand word essay by someone like Helen Garner. Is that uh, a moment of, do you feel privileged to be in that in that role? To be able to oh yeah, do? especially when, when you realise that you've really got something fantastic. Mm. Um, yeah, oh, look, it's absolutely, it's a, it's a, it's a gift. Uh, and sometimes, you know, look, all the initial reading experiences are different, of course. Uh, you know, sometimes you just know from that, from the first paragraph that you just, you're in safe hands and this is going to be a fantastic ride. Mm. Uh, and then and other times you sort of, you know, read something through thinking, oh, well, you know, a bit of work and this will this will be exactly, exactly right. And and sometimes, you know, you feel like it might need a bit of surgery and you've got to talk to talk to a writer and um you know look look any good writer knows deep down that if you have reasonable you know criticisms and objections if you're a reasonable reader and you have reasonable objections or criticisms and you're making reasonable suggestions then it should be fine and there should be it should be a mutually beneficial kind of process uh, it's it's so I don't I think it, I'm very careful with communications basically because mm. I think everyone wants their work to be better. Mm. There's a very very small number of writers who think that their words are utterly perfect, and it, uh, it's a really really small number. And I, I'm not enamoured of kind of working in that situation where you get something and it's like it's take it or leave it. This oh. is this is how it is. We're not. Um, yeah, sort of where you have to um, uh, y- look. It's just not. Um, it's not the way that I like working, basically, and I don't think it brings out the best in writers either. Yeah, writers who think that they file perfect the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah, not a great attitude. I got to say, as no, a writer myself. No, place. but what was um? Who was that? Harold Bloom was. There was some quote of him saying that he um. Oh, he basically did, didn't like working with editors, and I thought, well, mate, you've, you've just written like a thousand word, a thousand page book on something or other. I guarantee you that book, you know, would have been better at like 800 to, to, to 900 pages. Like, you, you just, the idea that you can, that you're the perfect reader of your own work is completely absurd to me. How do you know what your own biases are? Hmm. I mean that's what an editor for an editor is fundamentally just a good reader. And for a general interest mag like the monthly, you at times or maybe often I would imagine would be a stand-in for the average reader who might know about um, the topic that's being written about yeah. and, and yet is opening the magazine because they want to learn yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I it's yeah I look. 
that sometimes you have to judge those things based on like I'll talk to my sort of fellow editors and I'll go did you get that bit did you understand what he's saying about the you know mm-hmm. whatever shark's fin or the, you know the a triple c or something like this mm-hmm. so um but that's look that's 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 a really important part of of how we put essays and, and articles together is to make sure that there's not a lot of kind of detailed implied knowledge that it, it, it I always come back to it. It, it has to be a general reader an intelligent general reader that we're that we're that we're publishing for mm. at the front of the magazine you've got smaller stories shorter stories called the nation reviewed what in your opinion makes a great nation review story um well they're generally observational and they're observing things from a perspective that others haven't kind of recorded uh so whether it's if it's a comment piece that it's an original argument or at least one that puts information that we kind of know together in an original way uh, in the best possible way for for the sort of observational pieces that follow uh, well they generally have to be about some aspect of Australian life I like it to be about something that we may not have thought about or that there's a kind of detail in there that um, that we hadn't considered before or just something that's strange I mean I, you pitched something and we published that great little piece about the dog and cat pet programs in the in the prisons up in Queensland uh, where you, you so how would you know a general reader would have no idea that they bring dogs in and that you get these tough prisoners looking forward to having their weekly pet visit mm. dog visit that that's a kind of that's a great example of, of uh, a, an unusual kind of perspective on something that we know happens in society all the time but we don't know about so that, you know either whether looking at a kind of a a new angle on something in that's common in you know in in Australian life or someone that has a particular skill um look it's kind of it's kind of intuitive but mm. basically I if I feel like I've read it before, I won't commission it. Yeah, I was talking to another writer before I came here today to meet you. There, are, As a writer, those Nation Review pieces are an interesting um, challenge because you have to set the scene quickly, establish characters, mm. kind of get in and get out mm. quickly in a funny or interesting way in a thousand words. And yeah. There's not too many spaces like that in the Australian media. Landscape. No, no, there's not at all, no. So... Yeah, look, and I think because of that, after a while, we kind of get a pretty strong sense. You know, after doing it for three and a bit years, you can't have you have a strong sense of what the form is of that section, and it doesn't mean that they all read the same, but you become very quick at uh, figuring out what's just not right for that for that bit, um, and look, I think traditionally it was. It was a form that was kind of based on the the front section of the New Yorker, and it kind of talk developed of from there. Yeah, talk of the town, um, and also the idea of well, it's called the Nation Reviewed, that it is in a weird kind of way reviewing something that happened in the nation over the past month or two. Hmm. Um, so, but look, a lot of I think you know writers tell me that they really like writing those pieces um because they give you a chance to stretch out you know to really work every muscle mm. if, if you're writing you, you you get to play with almost with kind of fiction style techniques um you've got characters you you've got observation and detail there we don't um you, you really can go into detail there's enough room to go into it but not in a kind of boring I'm getting lost kind of way mm. um, and yeah. the need for brevity as well yeah 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 They're like 800 to 1200 yeah, yeah. At, at the moment generally yeah. yeah and yeah getting in and out that's a challenge for me as a feature writer it's always hard to write short the first paragraph yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. What do you need to see in a pitch to assign it, whether that's for the Nation Reviewed or an essay? Uh, well, I have to know, have a good sense of what it's going to be like when it comes out, when it, when it comes back. Mm. So I, I have to really know about the writer, their style, whether it matches the thing that they're pitching, as in whether their strength as a writer match their, the idea that they've put. Mm. Uh, so Does that make it harder for first-time contributors then? Definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, but we do take first-time writers look all the time. I think as many as... I, I, I actually should go back, but... I think we have a new piece by a kind of new writer of some sort or another almost every issue, which, um, uh, you know, is really gratifying and it, it's nice to keep sort of turning over new writers. But it is harder because, you know, on the one hand, they, 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 they're writing into a new section or a new form for the first time. We haven't figured out what our kind of working relationships like what the communication sort of styles are like what they like sometimes if we're reading a writer for the first time I'm, I'm still basing it on work that I've read elsewhere mm. which has been edited already so I don't actually know what their first draft was like yeah. or whether they just worked with a couple of really good editors that really cleaned something up nicely mm. and you know you find sometimes you, oh, it's you know slightly rougher than I expected <laughs> or something like that yeah. um, but in terms of people commission, um, pitching uh, it's, look it's, it's a combination it's a combination of the idea that they have to demonstrate that they understand which section which form they're writing into which part of the magazine it's to be published in uh, so at the appropriate length um, it has to be a good idea and that they have to be able to show that they, that they could pull it off and you haven't um, the need to not have read it before in your case, which means that you must have to read widely, both in Australia and maybe internationally, to see what else is out there. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, well, look, I do. I mean, I've always read a lot of magazines. Um, I've read, you know, I've always read the New Yorker and the. No, you know, not all of them, uh, but the, widely the New York Review of Books, London Review of Books. I read, you know, not every newspaper every day, but I read a lot of newspapers. So, I have a, you know, I have a, I have a vague sense, and sometimes you know that people have written about an issue, but they would never have treated it this way, or those. So there's, you know, there's always a little bit of guesswork, um, or sometimes. You just have to think, well, some writers will have read about this, but they probably, but probably only people who read The Australian because, you know, it was The Australian who wrote a story and then you think, well, there's a whole rest of the country that wouldn't have read that piece because there's only one of them published as far as I know. Um, so it's always a kind of toss-up. It's always a, a, you know, there's a lot of aspects to kind of weigh up. I'm guessing you say no to many more pitches than you say yes to? Probably, yeah. Because um, there's only so many slots per month. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, but it is a... Look, it's a, it's a combination. Um, I mean, look, we receive a lot of unsolicited pitches that we say no to, and it's simply because most of them just aren't appropriate. They're just not suitable. They're, they're not written in the right style. Um, they're not writers, they're not, um, you know, or there's something that we published like two months ago or something like that. Which shows so, they're not reading the magazine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it, it, it's very quick. It, you, know, you can often read. It doesn't take you long to figure out that they don't know who they're pitching to or that, um, that it's just not right for us. Uh, but sometimes, I mean, if it's people that I've worked with before, we'll often have a conversation where I'll say, look, we've sort of looked at it from that angle. Would you consider doing something in that same general area but doing it like this? Or, like, it, there's a back and forth that happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
but in terms of like knocking back things, look, it's yeah. Look, of course there is, but um, yeah, we still have to produce thirty thousand words a month, so there's a lot of saying yes as well as saying no. Mm-hmm. And that's what the mag consists of, 30,000 yeah. words? Yeah. There would be, I guess, the final issue of the year, the summer issue would be longer, right? Yeah, that's around 40, 45. Mm. Do you ever get sick of reading? Sick of reading? Yeah. Either for work or for pleasure. Do you find days where you're just overwhelmed? Um, I don't get sick of reading, no. I Sometimes I feel like I'm not ready and not sufficiently kind of... Um, rejuvenated to get straight back into the next issue Hmm. as in you know having when you go to press on Thursday night you don't really feel like coming into work on Friday with a messy desk and reading you know the first piece for the following issue Hmm. so might take a day or so to actually get back into that kind of um, the core product reading but Mm -hmm. uh, but look whenever I can I still read books it's you know it's difficult, but I make a priority of reading novels when I get a spare few days. You know, m- m- look honestly, mostly when it's I, I need a, like a long weekend or more than a few days away from the office to actually make it a, a chunk, hmm. take a chunk out of a book. But I still do try and read um, all sorts of you know fiction, non-fiction, um, new novels, old novels. Um, yeah. To take a step back, oh, coming towards the end, it's been nearly an hour, and you probably have some reading to do after <laughs> this, so I won't keep you much longer. How did you come to work at the monthly in the first place? Um, so, well, it's a, a, an unusual trajectory. Um, I well, I did sort of politics and literature at university, but then I got a job working at the Melbourne Film Festival. Uh, so I was a, a programmer there and I ran various programs like the short film program and the travelling film festival. Uh, I came to work, work with Schwartz Media about eight or nine years ago via, I set up a kind of video video arm of Schwartz Media called Slow TV which was long form video, so filming lots of talks and lectures, events, writers' festivals, um, just streaming lots and lots of long-form content. Uh, And then I sort of, from there, I sort of moved, while I was doing that, I sort of moved into text-based stuff. So I set up the, um, what's called today, that email was Politicos at some point, but now it's the, the one that Sean Kelly writes daily. That was one that I set up, and the shortlist daily was one that I set up as well. So at some point I was running those two daily emails and the video stuff and online blogs, like new sort of online only content, um, which was, yeah, it's a lot, a lot to do. Yeah. Uh, and then when John Van Tiglen left about three and a half years ago, yeah, I put my hat in the ring and... Um, yeah got the geek (laughs) what did you hope to achieve sorry what did you hope to bring to the role when you took on the being the editor of the monthly um look i didn't ever feel like it needed a huge deal of surgery as in it was a very strong kind of product brand magazine it had a it had a kind of personality already which was working well uh, yes, very strong subscriber base. Uh, it had carved out a niche that others had failed to do. Like many, many magazines over decades in Australia have kind of fallen over. Things like the Bulletin and um, what was it, one called The Eye and Time Australia. There's a whole series of magazines that kind of had tried to sort of fit in that space. and had not really um, worked for very long or had worked and then had fallen over at some point. So it's kind of cognizant of actually um, the importance of of um, just, just strengthening it, bolstering it basically, not making radical change, mm. 
but just sort of incremental improvements. I think I'm, I've tried to keep it, you know, tried to make it a diverse publication in terms of subject matter, like content and writers. Um, so like gender and ethnic diversity, um, you know, is something that I've sort of tried to tried to maintain or achieve. Um, and look, yeah, I, it's so important now with things like Fairfax dropping staff and other magazines falling by the wayside. I think it's so important that there is a magazine that um, that still edits strongly, that still publishes long form material, that still pays writers um, at, at you know decent rates. Uh, I think writers want to know that we'll look after their work. So, you know, that when you have someone like Helen Garner who, or, you know, Richard Flanagan, or that they want to write an essay, or Chalkus, they want to write an essay on a subject that they, that they need to know that we're going to look after their writing. And in, in, in that, like, that we're both going to test it and make sure that it's fine to go out. Mm in you know in the best form but also that we're not and and that we're not going to kind of butcher it or something like that but that it'll with that when it appears it'll be printed properly and that it'll you know that it, all, all these things are important so i just think it's look it's a culturally important kind of um publication so mm. not so much looking to um you know as i say to change it but just to keep on building is there anything you hope to achieve that you haven't yet in the role? I'm not that kind of person. Um, as in, I don't sort of... I never had a five-year goal for myself. I never had a... a honestly, it's a, it's a month-by-month thing. I, I have... You know, there's a handful of writers... You know, my one of my tests for myself and for the magazine has always been, do we... Will we... Can we hold on to the best writers, the ones that we you know most want to work with in in Australia? Uh, that to me is the kind of ultimate. Um, that that's one of the key um, indicators of success for me because I think if you get uh, if you get to hold on, maintain relationships with the best writers, then you'll produce the best possible you know magazine. Uh, so. You know, it's it, that's 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 my kind of aspiration, basically, just to, to make sure that I still keep um, relations with the people that I want to work with. Mm. Um, yeah, and payment is an important part of that because, mm. correct me if I'm wrong, there's no staff writer on the magazine. No staff writer. So they're all freelancers. Yeah, and they're all paid at. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's a dollar per word. Yeah, has been since the beginning. Yeah, which is above market rate essentially for long form content in Australia yeah it's still yeah it's definitely up there in Australia um, there might be a handful of specialist publications that pay more but um, not a lot and I mean look as you say it hasn't changed it's always been that so we haven't exactly um, you know we haven't followed inflation uh, I think compared to some overseas publications, it's probably not considered a you know highly lucrative kind of rate. But um, but I think it's a you know it's a still a respectable rate, and it's important for us to that we pay mm. you know that we pay properly. Finally, I believe the magazine recently made a additional commitment to art, long form arts coverage. Mm. Talk a little about that and why that's important to you. So uh, we're boosting our arts coverage online. So the magazine, I mean, the magazine has a set number of pages. So there's, if, if we were going to add more material, we'd have to pull other stuff out. And we don't, we don't want to sort of change the shape of the magazine. But we've always had additional um, material that goes online. And we, we basically decided to orient that more towards arts, arts and culture coverage, uh, essays and reviews, probably more than features. And it was a very, it was a deliberate decision. Uh, and look, you know, this is a, this is a drop in the bucket for in terms of what I think is required for a strong 
culture, a, st a strong culture of writing about culture in Australia. But there's so many, there's so fewer, there are fewer reviewers, there's, there's less space less time devoted to writing about culture in Australia than there ever was. Uh, the newspapers are struggling to deliver uh, anything like what they used to. Uh, for a while there was a sort of series, there was a stronger online culture in some areas that seemed to have dropped away. In some areas it's kind of come back and got strong again, like in film I think there's some really good online publications, but I don't think there's really, there's, there's not, almost nothing around say theatre, there's less published in terms of longer material on books than there's ever been. So I just, look I thought uh, it was an area that we could actually have an impact in as opposed to just adding to the pile of political commentary, mm. you know, like new daily takes about the day's politics. I, I didn't feel that um, that there was that much more of a need for that. Uh, so, uh, look, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. I think in terms of um, readership numbers, I think you're less likely to get huge spikes of readers to you know everyone loves to know that there's arts material arts reviews published online they they don't read as much as they um you know as we all uh you know people like to think that they like reading about arts and culture they, they read slightly less than you know than everyone understands i think hmm. um but it's it's crucially important though all right thank you for talking to me nick Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks for listening to Penmanship, and thank you to my guest, Nick Fike. You can find show notes to this episode, including links to many of the articles we discussed, at penmanshippodcast.com. If you enjoyed this show, there are several ways you can support it. You can share it with people in your life who love reading and talking about great Australian writing. You can leave a review on your podcast app of choice, where you can share your appreciation on social media. The podcast is on Twitter, at PenmanshipAU, and on Facebook. The theme song is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. That's it for now. Until next time. Mm -hmm.